Last week we introduced uh, Cornelius. I mentioned to you there were going to be a number of lessons concerning Cornelius because there are a number of questions in the life of Cornelius. Today we're going to be looking at Cornelius the good man. And that means we're going to be looking at when was Cornelius saved and we're going to be looking at the salvation of a good man. We are turning to Acts chapter 10, verse 1, and this is the first time we hear and see, scripturally, of Cornelius. Don't know anything else about him except what is recorded in Acts 10, Acts 11, Acts 15, but especially in Acts 10. And here's the way the scriptures would describe this good man. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea, Cornelius, a centurion, a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house, who gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now he saw in a vision about the ninth hour, an angel that would come unto him and saying, Cornelius, he would fasten his eyes upon the angel and be afraid. I need to stop and make a point. Every chance I get whenever I recognize that a human being has saw an angel in its full angelic being and capability, you will always see the human being being afraid. This is a Roman soldier. This is a centurion. This is a brave man. This man has fought in battle. And yet, he's afraid. A lot of people want to meet God and argue with God. Folks, you don't even want to argue with an angel of God. <laughs> you lose. By the way, that ought to help us in the book of Revelation. One of these days when we study Revelation and the angels fighting among themselves. Oh, that's a good discussion. Never happened. And so now when we see, we go on and we read verse 4, and he was afraid and said, what is it? Lord. And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are going up for a memorial, a reminder before God. And now send men to Joppa and fetch Simon Peter, who shall tell thee words. Cornelius is a good man. You look over his life, and I'll tell you what, you will not find very many men or women that will come up to the standard of living of Mr. Cornelius. Now we hear when a good person dies, people will say, boy, if anybody goes to heaven, he will. Or she's a really good woman. If anybody makes it into the pearly gates, she will. She, he, they are so good. What's the implication of that statement? The implication is that if you will be good, you will be in heaven. Can you be in heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ washing you of your sins? Can you be in heaven without believing that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God? And we are talking about those of us this side of the cross. How do good people who have not sought forgiveness for their sins through Christ, how do they stand before God? Folks, that's the man you're looking at, Cornelius. He does not believe in Jesus, doesn't know Jesus. He believes in God. But still we need to read this particular situation so that we can answer the question, what about the salvation of a good man without Jesus. Our lesson seeks to address what Luke wrote about Cornelius in contrast to what readers may interpret or want to see in the writing as to what Luke might have said. I'm going to now read you an article from a particular gentleman and I want you to see a contrast as we continue our lesson between what he writes and what the scriptures have to say. Our gentleman writes this, 
Cornelius was accepted with God, born again by the Spirit of God, and in possession of eternal life long before he heard of Peter. What do you think? Well, yeah, it says he was a good man. And if anybody's in heaven, he is because he's a good man. Is that true? His righteous actions and God's declaration about him prove that he is saved. Our gentleman continues and he says this. After he read Acts chapter 11, verse 14, which says, He shall tell thee words whereby thou shalt be saved. Look closely at Acts eleven fourteen. What's the discussion in Acts 11? Salvation for Gentiles. That's the discussion. So Peter is now telling the brethren at Jerusalem that he has to tell Cornelius words whereby he could be saved. Saved from what? Salvation from sin. But listen to our man. After all, he believes that Cornelius is saved before hearing Peter. That's what he said. Quote, Peter brought the gospel to save Cornelius. Oh, great. He agrees with us. No, he doesn't. <laughs> we cut him off purposely. Peter brought the gospel to save Cornelius from despair over his sins. Wait a minute. You've got a man saved from his sins and he's full of despair over his sins? To save a man from his sins, from Jewish ignorance of salvation, from Roman idolatry and superstition. What? Is this man full of Roman idolatry and superstition and he's saved? And immorality? And from conclusion about the resurrection? Does this man sound confused? He does to me. And he's wrong. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to contrast very quickly a number of passages. And all we're going to do is refer to these passages and call your attention to the meat of the verse. We're going to contrast this man's reasoning with the verse itself. First of all, Acts 11, 14, uh, who shall speak unto thee words, whereby thou shalt be saved, thou and all thy house. Is saved from the despair of being still in sin? No. Saved from his sins that he might not be in despair. Acts 15, verse 9. Acts 15, 9. God made no distinction between us Jews and them Gentiles, cleansing their hearts by faith. That means that Peter, that uh, Cornelius' heart had to be cleansed by faith. But wait a minute, he hadn't heard Peter's words. Keep that in mind. Acts 10, 43. Acts 10, 43. To him, that is to Christ, bear all the prophets witness that through his name, through his authority, through him, everyone, Jew and Gentile, that believeth on him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 15, 7. Acts 15, 7. Brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among you that by my mouth, said Peter, the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Let me hold my finger right there and you hold your mindset right there and I'm going back over to what the gentleman said. The gentleman said that Cornelius was accepted with God, born again by the Spirit, and in possession of eternal life long before he heard of Peter, long before he had faith. That's what the man is implying. He may not mean to imply that, but that's what, he, what he's implying. Acts chapter 10, verse 33. This is, Cornelia, this is Cornelius speaking, and he says, Now therefore we are all being, we are all here present in the sight of God to hear all things that have been commanded thee of the Lord. Acts 11, 18. 
Acts 11, 18. And when they heard these things, they held their peace. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also hath God granted repentance unto life. Acts eleven seventeen. If then God gave unto them the like gift as he did unto us also, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Acts eleven fifteen. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, even as on us at the beginning. Well, there is so much in those verses, isn't there? And nearly every one of them refute what the man has said. Cornelius was a good man, and he did not know and did not believe in Jesus Christ. Can a good man be saved without being forgiven? by Jesus Christ, by believing in Christ, without faith in Christ as the only begotten of God. There is no doubt that Cornelius was a good man, and I want you to go through these. We need to look very closely that indeed this was a good man, a man who needs the blood of Christ, but there is not really anything in his life wherein he needs to change to any great degree as far as morality and eth as far as ethics are concerned. But spiritually, yes, there's some things he needs to know and to apply. In, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Acts, Matthew 26, 26, this is my blood shed for many unto remission of sins. We need the blood of Christ shed for us that we can be and have a remission of sins. That's clear. What kind of man was he? This good man was devout. The question would ask if this man who is devout is saved. After all, if a man is devout, he obviously is saved, isn't he? Isn't that the same thing? Being devout and being saved? Well, let me see. I'm now looking at Acts chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. I recognize that the word devout means reverence exhibited, especially in actions. So this is a man who reveres, has respect, and he puts that respect in action. But now I'm reading Acts chapter 17, 3 and 4. And Paul, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Watch. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. He just said, as he's preaching, that those at Thessalonica, those that he preached to were devout Greeks and Jews. And he was preaching the gospel of Christ to them that they could be converted, and they were. But they were called devout before they were converted. I'm now reading in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. This is but a few months. This letter is but a few months from what you just read in Acts chapter 17 of their conversion at Thessalonica. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. What? You devout Greeks, men and women, were serving idols, and you turned from that to serving the living God. So devout doesn't mean saved. It could include idolatrous men and women. The second thing, this good man believed in God. No doubt about that. But he did not believe in Jesus Christ. No, about, no doubt about that either. Cornelius was not saved, though he believed in God, because, Acts eleven fourteen. 14, 
send unto Joppa and fetch Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou shalt be saved. Number three, this good man gave much alms to the people. Well, obviously, Ron, if you're giving much alms to the people, you're good. Yes. And you are saved. Not necessarily. I want you to note in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, a person may give alms unto God, but giving alms is not enough. Paul said, if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, if I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. If I don't have love for God, love for Christ, love for mankind, it doesn't profit me anything. I'm now reading to you an article out of, you can find it on the internet anywhere. There's dozens of them, but I'm going to read you this one. And I want you to ask yourself, okay, giving alms makes you a saved person. Giving alms makes you a saved person. The Satanic Temple, which is one of the largest Satanist organizations in the U.S., is an atheist group which uses the Juco Christian image of Satan to highlight and mock the overly suspicious, superstitious nature of religious thought and campaigns against the influence of religion in public life. Its mission statement, the Satanic Temple, its mission statement says, quote, the mission of the Satanic Temple is to encourage benevolence and empathy among all people. As a matter of fact, in the middle of this article, what they're doing, they're taking donations to help those who are lowly and in need. So giving alms is a sure sign that you're saved. No, it's a sure sign that you've done something good. And it may indicate that you're a good person. Fourthly, this good man was a praying man. Not only did Cornelius pray, but we're told that he prayed always. Not only does it say he prayed always, it said he prayed always to God. Now turn with me to Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we have a blasphemer of God. We have a persecutor of Christians. We have one who is taking the lives of children of God. We have one who has broken into the homes of Christians and dragged them out and place them into prison. His name is Saul of Tarsus, and he has seen the Lord on the road to Damascus. And the Lord told him to go into Damascus, and he did. And the Lord said unto Ananias, Arise, go to the street which is called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one named Saul, a man of Tars Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Okay. He saw the Lord. The Lord told him to go to Damascus, and there he shall be told what he must do. The Lord talked to his servant, Ananias, told him to go to the same place where he's going to find Saul praying. And when he finds Saul praying, Acts twenty two sixteen, he says, Now why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You've got a praying man who has seen God, has seen Jesus Christ, and yet he has his sins. He is lost. That's the same situation with Cornelius. He's a praying man. He's a good man. But salvation means more than simply one who prays. Saul, like Cornelius, prayed to God always. He prayed three days, yet Saul was not right with God. Yeah, but Ron, but Ron, it says that his prayers and his alms went up as a memorial before God. Indeed, they did. A reminder, this simply points out that God knew of Cornelius' prayers, but he knew of Saul's prayer. Go to the place in Damascus, the street called Straight, and there you will find a man praying. Praying. So, 
this is a praying man, a good man, but he's not saved. This good man had a respectful attitude and was just and had a good reputation or report of the Jews, Acts 10, 22. Almost unheard of from Gentiles to be so highly regarded by Jews, yet this was this man. He was highly regarded for his respectful attitude. Sixthly, this good man had a vision. Here is Cornelius about the ninth hour of the morning and he sees a vision. Has there ever been an ungodly man have a vision? Be supernaturally endowed? I turn back to Numbers chapter 22, 23, and 24, and there I read of Balaam. Balaam, who was a Gentile prophet of God, who was greedy, and he tried everything in the world to go against what God wanted. He even, he even caused the Jewish people to commit idolatry, and he died for it, Numbers 32. But Balaam, it says in uh, Numbers 24, verse 4, that he had a vision. Many think that if a person has a vision, this is a sure sign of personal salvation. Not with Balaam. Not with Caiaphas. In John chapter 11, verse 49 through 51, we read of Caiaphas, who was priest that year, who would prophesy that one must die for the nation that year. This spake he of Christ. But Caiaphas didn't know that. Caiaphas was a wicked priest. Yet he had supernatural capability. Simply because you have supernatural capability doesn't make you right with God. We go to the seventh thought concerning his goodness. This good man spoke in tongues, having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the like gift that the apostles received on the day of Pentecost at the beginning. We very quickly point out that this is not the baptism in the Spirit. So we will be looking at being baptized in the Spirit. But in this particular case, we recognize that he had the spirit and spoke in tongues, but so did the beast of Balaam. She spoke in a tongue. What do you mean, Ron? Well, a beast, a beast, a donkey spoke to her master. Donkeys don't speak. It doesn't matter about Mr. Ed. And some of y'all have no idea who I'm talking about with Mr. Ed. But horses and donkeys can't speak. It takes supernatural power. The last point, this good man wanted to hear preaching and he invited others to hear the gospel. It is highly commendable when one wants to hear the preaching of the gospel as did Cornelius. In fact, Cornelius is described as waiting to hear. Thus, he has an enthusiasm. He has an eagerness to know what Peter is going to tell him. And so here they are, they're all in the presence of God to hear all things commanded of thee from the Lord. In conclusion, I would kind of hit some basic points concerning what have we learned. In and of itself, without Christ, goodness is not enough for salvation. Cornelius, with all of his moral excellence and without Jesus, was not saved. He shall tell thee words whereby thou shalt be saved. Listen closely. If being good enough is good enough, then why did Jesus die? Acts 10, 48, Peter said, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You may remember that they were there, verse 33, to hear all things commanded thee of the Lord. Well, he heard, be baptized, be immersed in water unto the remission of your sins. That's exactly what Paul, Paul was told. Now, 
uh, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. And we also call to mind uh, Hebrews 9, 22, without the, without, the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we have to touch the blood of Christ. Acts 2, 38, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. Cornelius, in order to have forgiveness of sins, has to be baptized as a penitent believer. Like everyone else, his salvation is no different, even for a good man.